that's fine. That's that's a very good excuse. Good. I thought I thought it would be as much. So yeah. Now we're just <laughs> now we're just going to bombard the hell out of you with questions, sir. Okay, yeah. fine. This fine. is me. I panic. Fine. What I yeah, normally fine. do. What I normally do is I do a little intro, and then we just, as Tom says, we throw a load of questions at you. All right. Cool. I'll. I'm. I'm here to be thrown at. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, like yeah. It's sort of the way this works. <laughs> Wonderful. Right. Ladies and gents, today's guest is a one of a kind and a man whose talents have helped contribute to so many of our favourite shows as a kid. Most notably helping write the legendary Animaniacs and bring into life the hero simply known as Freakazoid. Today he can be found hosting his own Disney Plus show as Ned in Earth to Ned. He's an actor, a writer, a puppeteer and an all over awesome dude. Please everyone welcome to USUC Chronicles, Mr. Paul Rugg. Wow, that was very, wow. You know, I actually, I, I, I want you to like write all that down and, and email it to me. I'm going to put that in my bio. That's very good. <laughs> that was all like, I was like, hey, you know what? That, that's, who is that guy? He sounds amazing. So yeah. So I want, I want every piece of that. Lovely. Well, I love we got- how well over my intro is going. It's great. <laughs> Do a good job, sir. Do a good job, Paul. Yeah. How how has yes. the last year been, my friend? How's the last year been? Uh, uh, it's been, I think, like everyone else. Um, let's move on to twenty twenty four. Let's just sort of forget this all happened, and um, you know, yeah. But uh, yeah, just like everyone else, uh, unpleasant and. Uh, luckily, we finished Earth to Ned uh, back in December of uh, 2019, so we weren't affected by that. Um, but I was doing a, I was doing a sketch comedy show. I was sort of helping out uh, this comedy group in Provo, Utah. Um, they have a they have a show, and and um, we were just getting ready to do a show in front of like 300 people, and um, on a on a weekly basis. And then it was like, nope, you're not going to do that. And so doing sketch comedy for no one and filming it, we did it, but um, man, just an audience. It's, I mean, just like everybody else, you're like, oh, whatever. So yeah, moving on, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> did you, um, I bet that was quite weird, wasn't it? To like perform in front of nobody. Yeah, and then, and then it sort of forced us um, uh, or they wanted the company behind it was like, you know, we really need to, it needs to appear as this was in front of an audience. So let's do a laugh track. And what's amazing to me is the, the lost art of the laugh track. You know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm. when I was a kid, laugh tracks were all over the, the place, whether you liked it or not. Um, but I think that skill, like to, to go in and, and place laughs within something, something is a, is an art form that, uh, that I, you know, and I know a lot of other people have had to throw in laugh tracks and stuff, but um, yeah, unpleasant. I don't like them. Uh, I see their use from time to time, but yeah. Blech. yeah. <laughs> Can't say I blame you to be fair. It must be yeah. so weird going back over and over again and yeah. everything. So you just you know, don't find them funny after about the second or third time round. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess we should put one in there, but now I feel weird. Now, is that funny anymore? And uh, yeah. what's going on? So, yeah. yeah. Kind of Plus, I, I think for me, p- p- part of my thought is that because these are recorded laughs, is a very good chance that most of these people are dead. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> and it's like, you know, I think I think because they could have been recorded from the 60s for all I know. It's like there's a very good chance most of these people are now just no longer with us and it, it added a little spice of irony to that but anyway, yeah because yeah. you not have like um i'm trying to think like different varieties of laugh tracks are like ha oh, huh. do you know what i mean I'm like, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah 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 we had we had the whole gamut and and you know and button and it was just i don't like it sorry yeah, I'm no. done. <laughs> I don't, don't have to apologize to us. It's all good. But um, so obviously you've still been working during that time then. Did you have any yeah. time, like, not like furlough necessarily, but time to like learn a new skill or teach yourself anything new during the whole lockdown? Um, uh, gosh, no, no. Uh, I've, well, I've watched 2001, A Space Odyssey, I mean, more times than I can possibly tell you because that's <laughs> sort of my go go to. Well, I guess we don't have a thing today. Honey, I'll be in the bedroom watching 2001. Um, <laughs> Because Kubrick was trying to communicate something to me, and I'm going to find out what it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's sort of. Uh, uh, but no, I didn't. I didn't learn a skill. 
I should have. I shouldn't have wasted so much time on 2001, but um, but it's going to come in handy one day. I just know it. So you're not find out what he's trying to tell you yet, then? Uh, that he was like really brilliant, and no one will ever come close. I think that's basically what I always get at. Kubrick for me is is like it's fascinating. I I saw 2001 in. When I was a kid, my parents took me in 19, I forget when it came out, 1968 or something. And um, we sat in the very front row and this movie unspooled. And I, when we all you know, stood up, my parents were like, man, that was the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. That was, son, we're very sorry that we, and I was like, wow, this wild monkeys in space and, um, uh, uh, I'm just, I, I think it's because I, I was a kid, but that, that movie for me is like, it is just the most incredible thing. And I think in watching, you know, The, the Shining or Dr. Strangelove or, you know, other the movies he, he did. Um, yeah. Kubrick is my go-to whatever. So anyway, you probably didn't want to talk about Kubrick, but I love talking about Kubrick. That's fine. Don't worry about it. We can talk about whatever the hell you want, Paul. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> good excellent so take us back how, how did this all start for you was the plan to be an actor or a writer or something entirely different because you do so many different things what was the original yeah. plan uh, uh there was no plan which is which is sort of like the um sort of been my style um yeah i graduated college and then um i got like a management job at a at a talk radio company and I was the worst, I was like, I think I was production manager and I was the worst at it because I didn't care. Um, <laughs> so uh, it was terrible. It was like, did you record that copy for that uh, affiliate in um, you know, Wisconsin? And I was like, wait, oh no, I didn't. Anyway, so <laughs> that was sort of the story. That was sort of the, you know, it was a very bad job to have uh, right after college. Cause, um, and then, I joined a sketch comedy group called the uh, LA Connection. And, and what's amazing about the LA Connection, it's an improv group in the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles. And virtually everyone went through the LA Connection at that time. That was sort of the mid eighties, like everyone. Um, and learned virtually nothing. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and as, and then uh, a friend of mine, um, Adam Carolla, I don't know if you know Adam Carolla, Adam is- um, Yeah, I know of Adam Carolla, yeah. Yeah, Ad Adam's a podcaster here. So yeah. uh, I joined a, a group with him. Uh, it was a just starting out, a, a sketch comedy slash improv group called the Acme Players uh, in North Hollywood. And uh, had a great time, like honing sketches, putting it in front of an audience, seeing what they laughed at, seeing what they didn't laugh at. And just at that time, they were coming up with Animaniacs. So um, they sort of visited the different clubs and um, because they decided they, want, they wanted Animaniacs to have a very sketchy, very like, you know, boom, 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 boom uh, way of writing. So they gave me a sample script. They gave John McCann, who was also in the group, a sample uh, uh, script. We turned them in and then um, offered us jobs and that was so, so that was my first like real job job where it's like you walk in and people go, good morning. And do you like coffee? And uh, <laughs> we hope, we hope that script is going to be finished by Friday. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess it will be. And, um, <laughs> uh, and by the way, Steven Spielberg is his executive producer. And you're like, I'm sorry, who? Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was awesome. You know, I can't. Uh, it's so hard to um, quantify how great Anime X was. I mean, I'm so glad that it turned out great, but just in making it, it was kind of the last times in the 90 where it was like uh, everybody from the company on down, they just were like, whatever it takes to have a great show and, uh, and to make Steven happy. Um, you know, and we would walk around the office, if you will, I hope Stephen reads my script. Uh, and, um, you know, we were just all very, it really pump, pumped us up to really do a great, great job. And, um, and from that, I've learned a lot, which is, I think when we did Animaniacs, we had our, our, the creator of the show, Tom Ruger, who is a brilliant guy, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. 
And we sort of worked for him and then he would send the scripts to Stephen. That was the chain of command. It was simple, it was, it, it was easy. Shows I've done since, you know, you've got middle management, you've got Pete, you know, down there who handles this and Pete reads your script. And then there's, you know, Sandra, who's, uh, uh, Sandra's great at this. She, she likes to read Pete's notes. And then, so you got Sandra reading Pete's notes and it's like all these people it goes through then and it's like we didn't have any of that it was just like it was like you would you you wrote it Stephen went yeah I, I, that's fun um or yeah I don't, I don't think we want to make that one and then you sort of move move on but um but nowadays you know having sort of been through the ringer it just doesn't work like that you've got so many people involved in your business of of just writing something something silly and I think and if we had that on and Animaniacs, Freakazoid was even better because I don't think anyone really liked Freakazoid. Uh, Steven lo loved it, which was, which was great. But the WB, which was our first network that we were like written for uh, the, the WB, they, they kind of hated it. And, and we know they hated it because they kind of said, we hate this. And so <laughs> we're like, we're like, okay, well, then I guess you guys hate it. Um, but Stephen liked it, and we were having a great time. And pretty soon, they just didn't give us notes anymore. It was ju just like, eh, whatever. And we just started doing our own our own thing. Um, so we had Stephen really digging it. You know, he would he would call us or he would text and say, "Man, I don't know what this show is, but it's the stupidest thing, and I I love it." And we'd be like, "Okay." So um, yeah. So the, the, that time at Warner Brothers, I would say from like 90, 92 to when I left in 97 was uh, yeah, just amazing and magical and great and wonderful. So, yeah. I don't think I answered your question, but I sort of. <laughs> I, think, I think you answered about six of my questions without even knowing okay. it. Don't worry about it. All right, because I just, I just went, went off. All right, I'm done. We love it. No, we love it. Well, that's what we want. We don't. Okay. People listen to us enough. They don't want to hear from you. So, <laughs> yeah, um, cool. I mean, so when obviously the writing process, everything, did you get people being like, this is an idea we have, run with it? Yeah. Or was it like, yeah. go nuts? Um, for Animaniacs, so it, it, it would start with we would meet with uh, Tom and Sherry Stoner, uh, who is the story editor. We'd sort of go in his office and just sort of go, hey, I have this idea for. Uh, like one of mine was um, they meet Einstein and they try to sell him, you know, Boy Scout, Girl Scout cookies or whatever. And, and that was the threat of it. And then it was like, great, you have a week. And, oh, um, and that was it. And in the, so the way it works now is you go, I have an idea where the, you know, the, anim, the Yaka Waka Dot want to meet uh, Einstein. It was like, great. If you could put that in a paragraph for us, we would love to see it. So then you're like, well, all right, fine. So <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And you write this paragraph and then you hand it in. And then three days later, they go, great. If you could make an outline of what that is. And you're like, uh, okay. So then you do like a page. And a, so that's the way it works now. Back in the day, it, it was like, go, fine. They meet Einstein. And you had no, you really we had no idea and we all wrote in individually we didn't write as teams or anything and we would bump into each other's office you, you had a week and you had to make the idea work and the great thing about that is is uh because you're not working off an outline because you're not working off of a premise or anything you're just sort, sort of going it goes wherever you woke up that day decided and it would go yeah um, you didn't have to follow. Well, I told him it was going to be, I told him it was going to be this. So I got to do, do that. Um, I can't tell you how many Animaniac scripts I'd get six pages into. And they were generally about 12 or 13, 14 pages. You know, you get six pages in, you go, man, I hate this. And you'd go, or I would just say, fine. And I would start over, um, and write some, something else. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of the process. It was just, just boom, go right and come back, uh, and hopefully it'll it's good. So yeah. So 
it, like I was saying about the animes, it's such a wacky show and it's so unique. I don't think there's anything like it before or since. You know, right. how was that show pitched to you? Um, so it was, they sent over back in the day uh, when you were trying to get a writing staff, you would send over what they call the Bible. And the Bible is like, let's say 50 pages of, I mean, a stack of pages of here are the characters, here's what we think their catchphrases are, uh, just a lot of blah, 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 right? Uh, but, and I was like, boy, I don't, I don't really understand this, but then there was something in it that I went, okay, I get it. And it, 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 and it, it, it said, basically, these characters are the Marx Brothers. And I was like, okay, done. So I get, I, I'm a big fan of like Groucho and, and all that. Um, their movies are amazing. So for me, that, that was the end. It was like, great. So Yakko is Groucho. Um, Wacko is Harpo, who hardly ever talks. And Dot is um, Arto, uh, Kiko, I think. Um, oh enough. boy. They have one of them. One Someone of them. Must look it up. <laughs> but um, that, that was it. And if, 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 if you ever watch, like, Not at the Opera, Duck Soup, but Day, at, Day at the Races, if you watch those old Marx Brothers from the, from the 30s, um, that's basically the wellspring from, from where the Yakko Acker dot sprung, sprung from. So with the, with the writing, obviously we briefly touched on it then. Was it a case of, you know, you all write whatever you want to write or it's a case of, right, you you work on wacko skits you work on pink in the brain skits you work on this um uh at the beginning we were all sort of assigned to yakko wacko uh but then so so peter hastings uh who's a, an, an amazing writer he he no one had tackled pink in the brain yet no one had touched them so peter went off and uh he sort of in that first script, which is called Win Big, which is a whole, uh, where they go on Jeopardy, uh, or it's, I think it was called Jip Parody. Uh, it, it was in that first script that basically Peter figured everything out about, about Pink in the Brain. Uh, but gee, Brian, are you thinking what I'm th thinking? That's the first iteration of that, of that joke. Um, what are we doing tonight, uh, Brain? The same thing we do every night, Pinky trying to take over the world. And it's that, uh, so then Peter became the pinky in the brain guy. So he was sort of moved off into that. Uh, Deanna Oliver, she sort of really loved writing The Good Feathers, which was our sort of take on, you know, The Good Feathers and Casino. So she sort of became that. Uh, Sherry Stoner sort of moved into uh, Slappy Squirrel. Uh, myself, John McCann, we sort of were given, like my, my main task was Yakko Dot. That's, that's sort of what I did. Um, and then Randy Rogel, who did all of our songs and stuff, he was always in a corner of the, of the building with his piano, you know, always going, that's, you know, and we're like, okay, Randy, enough with the song. Stop with the song. Um, United States, Canada, go Mexico, we got it. It's good to say that must have been a nightmare to listen to going on. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, but it was it was like a zoo. It was a zoo, and we would be, and we were also our office at that time was uh, in Sherman Oaks, uh, at the world famous Sherman Oaks Galleria, which is where, which was the epitome of like where the Valley Girl came from, and and um, so our our we were on like the eleventh floor, and for lunch we would just go down to the to the mall. We would just, you know, take the elevator down and now we're in the, the mall. And I think that really helped us uh, because we were confronted with pop culture and all, you know, ev everything going on. Um, and so, yeah, that's, yeah. So that, that's sort of the, uh, that's how we were broken up. It's pretty cool. But with the humor in the Animaniacs as well, it's, there's so much adult, I know it wasn't intended as adult content, but, you know, when you look back now, it's, <laughs> was that an intention to have those jokes for the parents in there or was it just a we're just going to write what we find funny kids are like it. it's cartoon uh it it, it, it was the latter it, it was um like none of us none of us wanted to work write a kid show right so it was like what we wanted to do was make each other laugh um and 
it, but with the idea that, you know, kids are going to have to understand this. But I will say that Animaniacs carries the Warner Brother tradition, which is, um, if you look at the old Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, all, all those, those cartoons were actually produced at a time during World War II, where cartoons were actually shown before movies like Casablanca, right? So if, if, if you were to go see Casablanca, you know, a very serious, you know, film, generally, if it was a Warner Brothers movie, there was always a Warner Brothers cartoon in front of it, uh, not geared towards kids, but geared towards an adult or teen audience. Um, and I think that Animaniacs just sort of like, if you look at Disney, and trust me, I love Disney, they're, they're paying my bills right now, but <laughs> Disney, please. Could we just delete all the rest of it? No, no. Uh, Disney, <laughs> Di Disney at that time was much more, you know, kids and and you know, Mickey Mouse and stuff. And and I think Warner Brothers was sort of an a much more in your face answer to that I idea. You know, um, Daffy getting his bill blown off. You know, repeatedly. Um, if you look at those old car cartoons, they are, um, and there's nothing offensive in it at, at all, but they are definitely dealing with uh, adult themes. Um, mm -hmm. So I think Animania, this is, this is a very long-winded way. This is my you know, very long-winded way of sort of getting to your uh, question, which is we wrote them for ourselves, understanding that we could never leave the kid out. Um, mm. But we definitely wanted to make ourselves ourselves laugh and um uh it, i'll just go one more thing about what the warner's way is so if you have a if you have a group of kids sitting on a couch the the warner brothers way is, is so let's say you a three-year-old a six-year-old a 10-year-old a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old the warner brothers idea is that the 70 year old will laugh at something and all the younger kids will turn and look and go, why was that funny? And then they'll be told, well, that's funny because. So it's sort of like is an education in comedy. That, that's sort of the Warner Brothers way. Um, and unfortunately, I think children's television has become not that, which is like you, you are directly dealing with that four-year-old and you will, you, yeah. you're, only, you're only giving that four-year-old what that four-year-old can uh, understand, which is rather than sort of like the rich tapestry of comedy. So that's, yeah, there, I'm going to get off my soapbox now. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, do you think Animaniacs would stand up now from, because the culture now obviously is people seem to get offended by nearly everything. Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I would hope so. Um, I don't think we could get away with uh, a bunch of stuff. But then on the other hand, um, maybe we could. Um, like, I believe it or not, I have not seen the new re reboot yet, uh, mostly because we don't have Hulu. Uh, but if we had Hulu, I would w watch it. But uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think they're, they're pretty much following the same formula that we laid down. Um, and Hopefully that is showing people that, hey, you know, sometimes just funny is just stupid and don't overthink it. So yeah, exa I exactly. Hope. I don't understand why all of a sudden you have to now have cartoons directed. Like you were saying about the Love Looney Tunes with Daffy yeah. Duck getting his bill blown off. I used to love those back in the day. Like, yeah. you know, I've grown up to be a quite a decent human, I think. You know, I used to watch <laughs> Animaniacs, I used to watch, I watched watch everything back as a kid. But I think there's so much back then that you couldn't play now um, yeah. Because obviously everybody would be like, well, that's offensive to me because, I don't know, he's lost all his feathers and now he's naked. So right, yeah. Kind of I, just don't, I don't understand the concept of why all of a sudden everyone's like, well, I don't like that anymore because of this or that reason. I just think, yeah. I don't know, I think people need to grow you know, up. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I have no idea. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, maybe that'll all write itself self out and stuff. But, uh, but clearly comedy is based around, um, you know, most comedy is based around pain, right? Mm. So it's like, if you look at Yakov dot going against someone, uh, and that's the way we used to say it, like, you know, and Yakov dot in, in the old days, in our iteration, they would always go against those people that sort of in their, in their 
in their actions deserved it. And, uh, and they were always hoity-toity pe people. And that harkens back to the Marx Brothers too. Um, there used to be in every Marx Brothers movie, there, there was always this woman named Margaret Dumont. Uh, and who was always the very, she was this rather large, sort of very haughty person, you know? And, <laughs> and uh, she was this foil for them always to sort of make, make fun of. So, um, yeah, I don't know. So, was, you end, there you go. With the animatics, obviously you came on as a writer, but mm -hmm. you ended up doing several voices on the show. So yeah. How did that happen if you were there as a writer? Um... So, uh, Tom Ruger, our executive producer, he knew that I, you know, he had seen me perform, um, and, and he knew that was something that I really wanted to get get back to. Um, but I didn't. I was like, I was just happy with a job, where it was like, you know, honey, guess what? We don't have to find quarters in in the couch today. We can actually like, <laughs> there's something called a paycheck. Um, so I was fine with it, but. I used to do this really lame Jerry Lewis impression and drive everybody crazy, you know, the whole la 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 la. And, and one day Tom said, why don't you take that character and write, you know, the, the Yakawan dog go against the most condescending comedian in the world. And so I was like, okay, if that's what you want, I'll do it. So I sort of wrote, that's where Mr. Director came, came yeah. from. Uh, and he became a really good foil for, the three of them because you know he was sort of based on jerry lewis uh who i by the way i think is like royalty uh, i mean jerry lewis is amazing but there was a time in jerry lewis's life where if you would watch an interview with him he became this like very serious little man who would talk about comedy and its euphemisms and its explorationalisms and he would use words that by the way never made any sense and um and i loved that jerry because that jerry was so like what's happened to you you know and he would be because it's a cognizance it's a it's a knowing of the knowledge of comedy blah 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 so i th i thought man if there was any ever anyone for the yakko and dot to go against it would be this sort of bloviating uh comedic genius um and I think a lot of people thought that I was like making fun of Jerry. I was like, no, I, I actually love Jerry. I just find this, this particular Jerry a little bit hard to take. But anyway, um, so that's, yeah. And, and then from, from there, sometimes it would be like, well, who are they going to get to come be Einstein? Oh, you know, Paul, you do it or whatever. And, and, and so, um, yeah, that, that's how that occurred. So how did you come up with the voices for the characters that you play? Uh, for, well, for Mr. Director, it was clearly Jerry. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, bye, bye. um, and, uh, it was just that all the time. Um, for, you know, Einstein, it was your typically really bad, you know, um, uh, you know, this sort of uh, German child, um, <laughs> who's very chubby. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it was, it was that like, they weren't like earth sh shattering voices, but they got, they got the job done. That was perfection. That German accent was spot on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you ever, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there you go. So obviously Freakazoid came out of the Animaniacs. Was, was he always intended to get his own show or was it just a character that no, went over really actually, well? Uh, no, so so Freakazoid. So uh, when we were, uh, I think we were wrapping up our second season writing on Animaniacs, and Steven Spielberg, uh, I think Warner Brothers went to him and said, "Hey, you wanna you wanna do anything else?" And he had said, "Yeah, you know what? I'm really, I really like that Bruce Tim Batman. You know, uh, the Batman the animated series. Um, hey, maybe we do something like." like that. So Bruce Tam, who's like this amazing genius, and Paul Dini, uh, who wrote a bunch of the, the, the Batmans, they sort of built Freakazoid to sort of fill that niche that Steven wanted. The problem was, is that it wasn't overtly comical. It was more uh, edgy. And um, Steven 
had having now done Animaniacs before that Tiny Toons, you know, Pink, Pink in the Brain, he wanted something much more in your face comedic. Uh, and Bruce Tim was like, you know, that's not really my thing. So uh, they gave it to Tom Ruger. And I remember this was, uh, the, the WB was going to premiere in 1995. Mm -hmm. So this is 1994. Um, and the WB had already sold Freakazoid as, as being on the show. So uh, he brought me in, he brought uh, John McCann in and said, let's, we got to figure out this show. So um, that's how Freak Freakazoid was, was born. It is so funny. I, I was watching some clips of him earlier, and it, it's the running around, like pretending he flies. Yeah. It's so apt, so funny. So yeah. what led you from leaving Animanix? Was it the, pro the program ended or just you left the show? Uh, no. So uh, Freakazoid took, took over. So they basically said, uh, you're not on Animanix anymore. You're now on Freakazoid. Um, so An Animanix went, went on, and but Freakazoid became a priority. Uh, and so, and by, by that time I had written so many Animaniacs that it was like, oh, okay, good. Um, something, something new. So that's how Freakazoid, that, that, that's how I got put on Freakazoid. Ah, oh, fair enough. Because so that must have been quite weird for you then. If, if you just did the voice of Freakazoid like on Animaniacs, like, so Paul, do you want your own show now? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been nice. Yeah, no, the way, uh. Actually, I wasn't supposed to be the voice on, on that. They, uh, when we had written our pilot, they had a ton of um, auditions and they brought in a ton, of, a ton of actors, but we didn't really know what to tell them. Um, and so uh, we brought in you know, some really amazing, amazing actors and uh, we kind of wasted their, their time because we didn't really know what this character was uh, about. And uh, Tom Ruger said, hey, why don't you go in the booth and why don't you record what you think the character sounds like? And from, from there, um, they played it for Steven and we were really under the gun. There wasn't a lot of time. And St Steven said, just have Paul do it. So that's basically how I got cast. I wasn't supposed to be that. Um, so then I had du double duty. I was not only the voice, but I, had the, I was one of the you know, main writers. So yeah. You should know you definitely got all the best jokes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, no. You, you know what's interesting? I when I wrote Fre Freakazoid, I gave most of the the funny stuff to other characters, and I'm I still don't know why. I did, did, did you know, like Cosgrove, uh, the police chief? Um, yeah, yeah. It was fun though. It was great. That's really good. So you've done so many different projects. I was looking at your IMDb, and I was like, that's amazing. I'd like the all the different projects you're in, like Buzz Lightyear, Dave the Barbarian, American Dragon, which is a program I completely forgot about from when I was a kid. That was so yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Puss in Boots. It's but one thing I noticed is you play several characters in quite a few of these shows. Is that like a mm -hmm. common thing with voice actors, or is it just showing yes, the talent? It's off? very common. It's very com common be because uh, it's more economical for the pr production company because as, as an actor, you're allowed to do three voices before they have to pay you more. So it's to their advantage to get the main core and then from there y you can get three, right? So mm. um, now, you know, if you get, look at people like Rob Paulson, who's brilliant, Maurice LaMarche, who's brilliant, um, Frank, Frank Welker, to give them two voices is no big deal. To give them three voices, no big deal. To give them eight voices. But for me, sometimes it would be like, Paul, you're going to be uh, this and also, you know, a man. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, what does that man sound like? Uh, and I would always stress over that. But that's very common. You actually bled beautifully into my next question. Though, is that how do you differentiate each voice? Because obviously you've got to fool the audience. The audience isn't supposed to know that's the same person. Yeah. Um, uh, well, normally you're the, the director, the voice director, and in, in most of the shows I've done, it was the same voice director. Her name was Andrea Romano, and she's like an animation royalty. She's an amazing voice director. And she would just flat, flat out say, nope, sounds too much <laughs> like, you know, nope. And then you go, okay, shoot. Um, well, uh, what if I change it like this? Okay, good, fine, fine. Let's just do that. Um, uh, 
but for a show like Puss in Boots, where Artifius, the the alchemist, you know, he was very, you know, he was a very specific voice. It was pretty easy to get away from that voice or Dave the Barbarian, um, which is just this high pitched, you know, whiny piggy. Um, I, I think Dave the Barbarian sort of sound like that. It's really easy to move away from that. It's where you're mm. doing sort of middle of the range voices that they tend to bleed in. Because I, I can imagine that can be quite a challenge sometimes, especially if you're doing so many. It's like, I can't even remember what I did for the last guy. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's yeah. Uh, normally, that's why they didn't always give me a bunch of voices in a show, because they're like, Paul, no. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that's always confused me, me confused me rather, tripped over my own words, and when it comes to writing TV, and it's in your career, so I'm using you here to basically find out and answer the question I've always wondered. It's, yeah. With writing credits, you, you quite often brought on for like one episode of a show. Mm -hmm. so what What is the reason for that? Some shows don't have like, you write the whole series. Why is it sometimes you get brought on just to do one episode? Well, uh, so on uh, Animaniacs, if I go back that far, we were a writing staff, right? I think there was <laughs> there was Sherry Stoner, Deanne Oliver, Pierre Hastings, Randy Regal, John McCann, Tom Minton. Um, and we all, uh, because there was so much, when, when you think about it, we had a 65 episode order, that first one, each, each cartoon had, you know, pretty much, or each episode had three cartoons each. Um, there was no way a team could write that. Um, so it was like, okay, you'll do that one, you'll do that one, you'll do that one, you'll do that, that one. And we just sort of built it up like that. Um, but a lot of times a show doesn't have a writing staff per se. It has a freelance writing staff where it's like, you know, you're not all there con contributing. Um, so that's why sometimes you see one person brought on for that one person brought on for that. But there's just so much material. Um, there's no way that you could write together. In fact, on Animaniacs, we rarely like to team up with each other because um that slowed the process down right you, you have mm. to go what do you think i don't know what do, what do you think and it's like much better for one person's vision for each story to just go so yeah i suppose that works better in that animaniacs like skit environment as yes. well anyway because it's not it, it like does. you're following the story per se so. right yeah 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 so obviously you're also a puppeteer which is really really cool so how did that come about? Was that an interest you chased personally, or did someone come up to me like, "Want to learn?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly how it how it happened. I mean, I I loved the Muppet Show. I was a big big fan, but never really thought about that as as an avenue. Um, right after Freakazoid ended, I sort of was looking around, and I wrote a pilot for the Jim Henson Company, and um, based on that, they were. <laughs> I think a couple of years after that, they were developing a, an, an improvised puppet show um, called Puppet Up. Uh, but I, actually, no, I'm wrong. What, what they were doing was Brian Henson wanted to uh, sort of recharge his puppeteers to, um, to feel that energy again. So he formed an improv group for no one to ever come and see, but just sort of an internal improv group for everybody to sharpen their comedy skills. And he invited me, they invited me to that, um, to sort of contribute crazy ideas, you know, stuff like that. And um, they, based on that, they just taught me how to puppeteer. Um, and uh, then, then the show actually became a live stage show. We did the Aspen Comedy uh, Festival. We then went to Edinburgh. Uh, to do um, the Fringe Festival, then oh, we wow. went to Australia, and yeah, we did a bunch of stuff. So every night, in front of a thousand people, we would, you know, we would, we would just do improv with puppets in front of an audience. So that's basically how I learned how to puppeteer. Um, and I will tell you this: I'm not as good. I'm really lousy compared to these amazing puppeteers uh like drew massey um alan alan troutman bill beretta uh brian henson they're just like yeah it's in their blood uh, literally and brian amazing. henson <laughs> yeah right yeah 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 
right that's really cool though that you, you know you started your career in improv and then you learn this new skin like ah let's put these two together yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it was fun it was that fun. was really cool so from puppets it, you know that, that leads very nicely into earth to ned which i've got to admit i'll put my hand on my heart and say i hadn't really heard of it before i was doing the research for this show i like i'd seen it on mm. disney plus but i've never really looked into it so i watched an episode earlier on today before we jumped on and it's absolutely brilliant. I'm going to go back and watch the rest because it is superb. Oh, and I'm good. not just saying that to blow great. smoke. It is brilliant. Oh, but for, for people that haven't heard of it, how, how would you describe this? Because it's so unique. Um, Earth to Ned is, is a talk show hosted by an alien who was sent to Earth uh, by his race to, uh, to take over Earth and to wipe it out as they have done countless times throughout the galaxy. Um, the problem is, uh, is, that Ur, is that when Ned got to Earth, he sort of fell in love with pop culture and celebrity culture. And so rather than, rather than destroy the Earth, uh, he decided that he would do the next best thing, which is uh, interview celebrities um, <laughs> and, celebrate, and celebrate humanity and, um, and that's kind of the way Brian Hinson, you know, pitched it. Uh, when I went in for my audition, uh, he, he was like, look, this show is hopeful. It's fun. There's not an ounce of negativity in it. It's, it, it's about this alien who loves humans and everything about humans. And most especially the celebrities, because he's really into celebrity culture and pop culture. Um, and he wants to learn all about being a human. Um, so that's basically what the show is. And uh, it, it was so fun to do. So fun. I watched the episode of um, Alan Tudyk in it. Yes. And oh, my God, that, that guy's hilarious in general. And then you put yes, that yes. put him on that show. And oh, I was in tears. Yeah, I was yeah. like, this show is brilliant. So oh, good, good, good. Excellent. But how did this come about? Because obviously it's one of the it's, correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't this one of the first original programs on Disney Plus? Uh, well, actually, uh, Disney Plus had started. We were, I think, we were in production just as, uh, well, Disney Plus actually hadn't even premiered yet. Um, so, yeah, we, we, were, we were destined to be uh, one of their first shows, but then COVID happened and post-production sort of threw that, that all off. So I think we premiered in September of 2020. Um, and we did two seasons and the, the, uh, the second season is now dropped. Um, but yeah, we were, we were one of the first, first shows that's, that's uh, good. produced for them. Yeah. That's gotta be quite an honor considering how huge Disney plus is now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it is. It, it is. And I'm, I'm hoping that we get another, another go. I really it hope you do. Be Cause it is absolutely wonderful. Oh, good. I, uh, Good. I see my uh, co-host as a uh, rejoin. I'm so sorry. That's <laughs> never happened before. The internet just cut out. That was it. Done. Oh, I know you went and mowed your lawn, but that's fine. I did. To be fair, Paul, I was sat there, I was going, oh, really? <laughs> it really is doing. She's probably going to do that right now. <laughs> I was like, they won't notice I'd slip off for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but I'm just going to jump in because see, I've noticed it's happened the past yeah. 10 minutes, but your YouTube channel. Yes. What is it called? <laughs> How do you pronounce uh, that? <laughs> uh, it's called, okay, so I have no idea. It's called Paul Ruggs Freundleben. Freundleben is one of the words that Mr. Director and Animaniacs would say. He would go, Freundleben, which is a Jerry <laughs> Lewis sort of uh, uh, ex exclamation. And so when, when I decided like two years ago or three years ago, I go, you know what? I'm just going to put stupid stuff on YouTube. It said, great. What do you want to name this? And I was like, oh man, I don't know. Uh, oh, Freundleben, fine. Freundleben, that's, I have no idea what that means, but it won't even matter. So um, yeah. And I only, the, the reason I put, I put stuff on YouTube, most of which like have four views. Uh, it's still great though, is, um, it's just fun to do stupid things. Um, uh, and I think only one of them, or a cu couple of them, all involving my chihuahua, those are the ones that people are like, oh, chihuahua, great. You know. But the ones that I spend like 
months editing, they're like, yeah, well, I don't know, yeah, whatever. But <laughs> your chihuahua, that's what we want. So fun. So, so yeah. cause that video was lucky where you're talking about yeah. how dogs are better than cats went viral, went mental. Yeah. Because I remember yeah. being on Facebook and going, what's this video? So I watched it, was at, found it absolutely hilarious. And then when I was conducting my research, I was like, no fucking way. I remember that video. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just yeah. putting my mind a little bit. But the the one, the lift as well, was really funny. Really. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The microphones. Yeah, so good. Yeah, one of one of the very uh, few times my wife actually lets me uh, sort of borrow her to be in the videos. <laughs> Normally, she's like, I don't want to. I don't ever want to be with. No. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I was like, hey, I really I have this idea. And she goes, OK. So she did it and um, yeah, that was great. But the lucky one, which was shot on that, I'm pointing, that's the chair. I, I, oh, that's, no way. that's a new dog, that's Marge, by the way. But anyway, Hi, Marge. Marge, she's been drinking. Um, <laughs> uh, the lucky video was uh, my friend, I have a friend named uh, Tom Wilson. Tom, it was Biff in Back, Back to the Future. I don't know if you, uh, he was, yeah, yeah I, and he's. I um, emailed him the other day. <laughs> oh yeah, he's a great guy. He's like one of the smartest, most brilliant people I know. And anyway, Tom and I did a show together on Nickelodeon called um, uh, "Pig Open Banana Cricket," and we had two years of a lot of fun. I think four people saw this saw the show, but we had fun and we were paid, so that's the most important thing. Well, but anyway, Tom was over at the house here one day, and I I was holding Lucky because Maria, my wife, had to go do something, and and I. I had to hold Lucky, just, I think keep him from getting out of the house. And I rested my hand on him and Lucky started biting me, and, which is what this dog does, which is what a lot of chihuahuas are like that. He loves my wife, you know, but I even look at him the wrong way and he attacked me. And Tom said, you know what you, you should do? You should do a video where um, Lucky just bites you while you're petting him. And I was like, yeah. I don't think so. Who the heck's going to watch that? <laughs> um, so one, one day I was riding and then when, as soon as I finished riding for the day, I, I asked my wife, I said, can I borrow Lucky for like a minute? And she goes, why? And I go, I'm just going to do a really stupid thing. So I, I sat there, put up the camera, did it in one take, put it up on Facebook for my friends to see because I was like, no one is going to care. And mostly to prove to Tom that I actually listened to his I idea. I put it up on Facebook, went about my business. And the next thing you know, I'm getting all these calls saying, are you the guy who was a chihuahua? And I'm like, yeah, uh, <laughs> is it out? Do I need to go pick it up or something? And it's like, uh, <laughs> you know, well, what's the deal? And uh, they're like, well, your, your little video, um, I think it passed like a million in like an hour or something. It was nuts. Really nuts. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, well, this is, this is odd. Uh, having spent most of my life struggling over scripts, for weeks and crying and going, no, it's there's a comma after the Y. Uh, to sit in that chair and just sort of go for like a minute and to have people go, well, this is your legacy. Your, your, ch <laughs> your chihuahua will bite you. And this is what you'll be known for for the rest of your life. I'm like, okay, fine. So um, yeah, it was crazy. It's like, uh, Paul, can we book you? What, for anime next? No. Freakazoid? No. <laughs> Earth to that? No. Your dog, lucky. No. We, we just want your dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, 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 it's true. In fact, I got an email the other day. It was like from someone in J Japan. It was like, you know, hello, we, uh, we like your dog. Um, can your dog, can we, can we, and your dog, it was something about Lucky, and I had to break the news to them. Unfortunately, Lucky died, uh, which he Aww. did last year. Yes, he um, he he was old, and um, he um, it was a very sad sad day. But uh, Lucky passed passed away. But um, uh, trust me, I've been thinking maybe you know to talk to my wife. Maybe we should get another Chihuahua. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so, um, yeah, Lucky was amazing. He, he was the sweetest little, little guy. It's just that you couldn't, I could never pet him or he would just attack me. And then once you start petting and he, he'd be like, Hey, what do you want to go do? Um, <laughs> that was, yeah. He was great. Looks like you're up, Marge. <laughs> <laughs>
She quits the day drinking, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, for you later. <laughs> we went, we went off a complete tangent then. I didn't actually finish my questions about Earth to Ned. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so I was just going to say, obviously you did the voice of Ned. But and do yes. you do you, you puppeteer Ned and do the voice? Yes. That's yeah. amazing. So do you do that yeah. at the same time or was the voice recorded after? No, no. we do it, we do it all, all at once. What hat was That's so amazing. Ned takes Ned takes six puppeteers to do in tandem. So uh, there is a performer inside the actual body, and he's sitting in a little chair, or she is, I'm sorry, it's uh, Morgana, and and sort of moving the body like this uh, back forward. And then Donna Kimball is in the front with the first two hands. And then we have Puppeteer on either side doing these hands. Next standing, and I'm like 20 feet away. Uh, and I've got this rig. Uh, it's basically, it, it, it's this crazy contraption that I put my hand in and it has all kinds of different axes. So it goes this way, it goes this way, it goes this way, it goes this way. And depending on how I move my hand within this rig, it causes the lips to, to come together to go wider. And then standing next to me is Alan Troutman, who's this amazing puppeteer, and he's just doing Ned's eyes. So I'm doing the voice and sort of leading what the discussion is gonna be. I'm talking, I'm doing the mouth, but all the other puppeteers are sort of working off of that. And all of us are sort of creating the character live. Um, so at first, when we started, it was like, it was, it was awful because we didn't know each other then. It'd be Ned be like, oh, rah, 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 rah. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but then after about a month of rehearsals, cause Brian was like, you guys got to be locked in a room for a month. So we were in the Jim Henson creature shop for a month, just, just improvising and and coming up with Ned's moves and and stuff and then when we actually started we never thought about it again we just sort of ran and and did it and um I think the biggest compliment is and what's kind, kind of cool is that people think it's just this one character but six of us are working at the same time to to pull it off it's That's great it's fun crazy that is amazing yeah. So, so what's coming up next for you then? What are you working on that you can talk about? Uh, well, um, it's hopefully another season of, of Earth to Ned. And then I'm developing uh, a new animated series that uh, I can't talk about, unfortunately. Uh, but it's, 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 sort of, it's sort of the love child of Freakazoid, I will just say. It's, uh, it's bizarre and silly and weird and... Um, so that's, but it's not got anything to do with Freak Freakazoid, but had we been given a third season of Freakazoid, it would sort of have been like this. So that's basically it. That's amazing. Tom, have you got any more questions? Yes. Mr. Rugg. <laughs> <laughs> that's very formal, wasn't it? Yes. Did, did you ever think? Fact, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it so that, like, yes, yeah, so absolutely. Uh, yeah. No. Um, did you ever think that life would turn out the way it has? Did you ever think that, you know, anime would be as big as it is and things would just blow up for you? Uh, no, I mean, no, uh, definitely not Animaniacs. And, uh, and, and by, by the way, it's like, as, as you probably know, like in everybody's life, there, there, are, there, are, there are highs and then there are troughs. And yeah. so it's like, you know, you, you wait and then you sit around for a year and then something good happens and then there's a trough. But I remember right before, I think the week before Animaniacs pre premiered, uh, I was taking a walk because we would take a break. We would walk around uh, the mall and then walk out outside. And I remember walking with Peter Hastings, who I mentioned before, who's sort of, uh, who was also a writer on Animaniacs. So we we're walking and I was like, Peter, are we just going to be killed? Uh, are people, people are going to hate this show that we've come up with. And he's like, I, you know, I don't know. I may, maybe I, it's who knows. And it's like, uh, it, so you never know. Uh, you never know. Like we didn't know that people would like it. Uh, and I'm really glad they did. And, um, and with Fre Freakazoid, I'll tell you when we were doing Freakazoid, um, we, we had crickets. Right, it's like no one, 
no one cared, no one really, you know, liked it. And then now with time, um, people are saying, hey, Freakazoid, wow, that was, that was amazing. But when we make it, we didn't get a lot of, a lot of love for it. So I think the answer to that is you never know if people are going to like your stuff or when they will like your stuff. But to just always do what you do. And sometimes that's gonna be a hit and sometimes it's gonna be a miss, uh, but that's sort of life. And um, you just, yeah, just do what you do. And, you know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's sort of my answer to that. Amazing. Right, before we let you go, we have a quick little game we like to play. And we, call, we call it the quick fire round. It's literally five okay. questions and you answer them as quick as you can. Nice. Oh answer. boy, that's hard for me. Okay. All right. I have my pen. Go. <laughs> Favorite pizza topping? Uh, pepperoni. Very popular answer. Your yeah. favorite Muppet? Uh, Miss Piggy. Oh, good answer. The first concert you ever went to? Beach Boys. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah. Who would play you in the movie of your life? Uh... Oh, sh- um, uh, oh, Ryan Gosling. <laughs> <laughs> An excellent answer, sir. Perfect there answer. You Perfect answer. There you go. Okay. And, and last but not least, a piece of advice you would give to a younger version of yourself. Uh, d- don't worry. Don't Wonderful. worry. Nice. Very nice. nice yeah, simple. I like well, it. Good. Paul, this has been so much fun thank you so much for doing this it was fun all right thank you guys but uh, before we get out of is there any like social medias any websites any anything you want people to um, make sure they yeah, check out well y- y- yeah you can you can go <laughs> if you're brave enough or strong enough you can check out my really stupid youtube page uh which is paul rugs point laven um and if you wanted to follow me on on instagram although i don't know why you would but if you were of a mind to do that it's rug r-u-g R U G G one, uh, and that's my. Uh, don't ask me why I did that again. It was one of those things. What do you want your thing to be called? I'm like, I. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and so anyway, there it is. That's it. Incredible. Again, thank you, so, thank you so much for doing this. Has been so much fun. Okay, guys. Take care. Have a great, take care, have a great day. Thank you, Paul. Cheers. Bye. Bye.